it seems like uh, a lot of the things that self-help uh, authors write about uh, might very well just be a message to themselves. Uh, they're talking to themselves, trying to help themselves get through certain things. So I'm wondering, how did you come to decide that mindset was the thing you really wanted to double down on? Right. Well, I've always, mindset is just a, a name that encapsulated a bunch of concepts that I studied, applied, learned elsewhere. And it was a good catch-all label that tied everything together when I was writing for, when I was writing for other people. And th so that's the difference. The difference is that the, 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 the words you use when you're talking for other people are always going to be a little bit different than the words you use when you're talking for yourself or, you know, working, working on yourself. And I found that mine's just a huge word now, but if you check the Google trends, you, it's kind of wild, actually. You can see actually on Google trends when Gorilla Mindset was released because search interest and the word spiked. And now it's a super common term that everyone uses all the time. Like you can't run away from it, but it wasn't that widely in use when I was, when I was using it. And I think that shows either I was riding the wave. I made the wave, some combination of both came in. So for me, it was always, I wanted, you know, I, I always wanted to live a better life. I think everybody wanted to live a better life. So in that way, it's just human, but I didn't have, I wasn't blessed with a lot of gifts. I, you know, was, was very, I had asthma as a kid, was kind of the fat kid growing up, grew up pretty poor. Dad, you know, terrible factory jobs when he had a job and, and thankfully he usually did, but it wasn't very much money. I mean, I always tell people, I remember one day, if you're young, you won't get the reference, but I was reading Parade Magazine and Parade Magazine was an insert for the newspapers. Because even if you're poor, you could still afford the, the weekend newspaper. Everybody kind of read the same news. There was a little insert magazine, Parade Magazine. Um, Marie Vossavant, the, the person with the highest IQ, would have her Q&A. It was a fun, fun little thing. And I read something about, it said the poverty level was if you make X number of dollars for a family of four. And I was in the bathroom and I saw my dad's pay stub and I go, man, I think the number was 13,000 for a family of four, whatever the case was. My dad was making $10 and 50 cents an hour at the job. And there were six of us in the house at the time. So I, I, I always knew I was poor, but I didn't really know mathematically how poor we were. So in my case, there was, there was no way out unless I kind of figured it out. I had to look for tools to figure out answers. I had to apply the tools because finding a tool isn't going to do it. That That's just watching porn, essentially. So I had to really apply this stuff. And then, you know, then I would level up a little bit. But as you level up, you hit a new ceiling and you get hit, you get smashed, a new, a, a new situation. So for me, for example, one issue I struggled with for a very long time was money. And even when I made a lot of money, I was broke. And then I would not make any money and I would be kind of broke all the time. So I didn't, nobody ever taught me about like cash flow management. Two good months doesn't mean you're going to have a good year. Two great months doesn't mean that that's going to last. The same th reason NFL players go broke. You're thinking, oh, I'm, in, I'm making millions of dollars a year. It's like, no, no, no. You're going to make $10 million over the course of three years. And that has to last you 50 years, right? So you, you, hit, you hit a ceiling in all kinds of areas of your life. So then I would try to get through that ceiling find a new solution. And then as you go deeper and deeper into the game of life, the world of life, you're always having bigger solutions. You're always having bigger challenges. You're put, and then if you push yourself harder, even if you have a good life, then you push yourself harder, you're going to have a new wall that you're going to hit. So the mindset game never ends, honestly. If you want to live, if you just want to coast, then sure, it, it could. But otherwise, you're always going to run into a new, a new problem to solve. You're an autodidact, man. You just figure things out. You teach yourself. No one is going to get in your way. No one's going to stop you. You just picked up a million skills along the way, and you've just educated yourself and given yourself the tools that you need to get the job done. So just some advice for guys out there who look at me, they look at you, they look at other people who are making money, who are living a good life, having a career, sort of doing the same things that we're doing in social media and content creation and such. And, and out of all the things that you picked up along the way, what do you think was the most powerful skill that you didn't have, that you learned about, acquired, and have applied? 
Well, the number one skill is probably the meta skill. The idea that there is a solution, you have to look, look at it and, and solve it. So for me, I'll do, I'll post something. Uh, and then people ask me about this thing I posted. And that tells me that they're stunted, right? So if I say, like I always tell people, I, I say every man, woman, and child who's ever had a mental health condition or think they might should look into n acetylcysteine And then people be like, well, what's NAC? I don't know, dude. What am I, your tutor? How, how about you go, why would somebody mention mental health in the context of NAC? And then go off on your rabbit hole and do, you know, a few hours of work. So there's, this has been... I don't know if it, I don't know if it's a generation gap because it isn't like I look at men in their forties and think, boy, these people really got it together. But there, there is a sense where people have lost the meta skill of how to learn. I always thought if I, if I did another master class, and I don't know how I would do it. That's why I haven't done it. It would be a class on how to learn. Okay, so somebody mentions this. Here's how you would go through and analyze the data, or analyze the research, or figure things out for yourself. So the biggest thing I tell people is you you're going to be able to figure it out if you if you know how to do the work and if you're willing to put in the work. But most people aren't. And it's weird because we grew up in Google, but people don't Google anymore now. I was talking to actually Cortez about that. This was a few years ago. I said, man, the dumbest people ask me the dumbest things. I'm like, why don't you just Google it? And as much as Google's big tech and it's bad and blah, blah, blah. People don't. It's, it's like you would think that the younger people would have more facility using these tools, but they actually don't because everything for them is just scroll, scroll, scroll. If it isn't on Twitter, if it isn't my timeline, if it isn't my Instagram thing, then I'm not really going to read it. And that's what I learned. Another thing I learned, too, is people are very attached to their platforms. Right. So if they're if you're on Twitter, you don't read this is. I'm different and probably you're different too. If I read something interesting on Twitter, cause I'm usually reading Twitter from my laptop, I go, well, that's interesting. And then I look it up. I'll go to PubMed or I'll do DuckDuckGo, Google, Bing, whatever people do. And I'll say, that's interesting. And then I'll be an hour in this other rabbit hole. But I don't think a lot of people go cross platform or I'll buy the book. I'll say, oh, somebody mentioned a book. Or if I listen to a podcast, Oh, that's an interesting book. And then I'll download the audio book and I'll start listening to the audio book on my hike. So people, and I learned this when I was moving around the platforms, people are very domain specific. If they're on Twitter, that's all they use. They're not going to go look for answers anywhere else. People are mad that I, I made it now so people can't reply to my tweets. And I said, well, I have a telegram and I have a commenting community on telegram. Why do I want to go on telegram? Well, then f- you then how about f- you, right? <laughs> If, it, if it's so important that you comment, then all you have to do is install another mobile app, go to Telegram. But no, people are very, and that's probably why tech companies do tend to have a monopoly. The network effects are there. The network effects are sticky. But that really holds people back in a lot of ways where they think, oh, it's insurmountable to install Telegram, right? To me, that's just the dumbest thing. What do you mean? You just, it's easy. What are you, what are you talking about? But they've been raised on these. They never leave their little silos. And then because of that, if they don't read it on Twitter, they're not going to say, oh, I re- uh, that's a good audio book. I heard about on Twitter. And maybe <laughs> I should go download the book and listen to it while I go take a walk. So people, they're living – because I know because I follow a lot of people. I follow thousands of people on Twitter. And people don't post the, the stuff that I post. They don't post good music for the most part. They're not posting about camper vans, yurts, alternative living they're, they're largely mad that they can't live in a McMansion, which I don't live in a McMansion. You don't. Um, you know, we've always lived in very small home situations. And I'm thinking, God, you're a guy in your 20s with no kids, no obligations. You could probably live off in the right area, 2200 bucks a month and, and live nice, right? If I were in my mid-20s, I could live nice off 2200 a month, right? 800 for a place. You share it with a friend. Or just go where the land is cheap or, you know, convert a, convert a van, get a yurt, get some cheap land, work whatever jobs. It doesn't matter. Figure other things out on your own. So it's a very, very conventional mindset, too. So that would be my I guess if I had to tell people who really want to change it, but you're just you think way too conventionally. There's all these cliches. The rebels buy a MacBook, right? No, the rebels don't buy a MacBook. 
the rebels are moving to South Dakota outside of the city, getting cheap land, and they're traveling across the country in a, in a van conversion. Or they're or, or they're, they're, they have a yurt so that they don't have any fixed housing expenses. That's what unconventional people are doing. They're not sitting on Twitter all day mad that they feel like they didn't get their birthright because the boomers blew everything up. So it's, it's trying to teach people to think much more unconventionally rather than just say, okay, here's my lifeline because that's my whole life. Where, you know, where I'm living now, I never planned it. It couldn't have planned it. There's no way in the world you could have planned it. I just have always lived an unconventional life, always done things a little bit differently. And that, that led me here, you know, because if you have kids, the, the game changes a little bit.